Well, we go to the I <coughs> oh dear. Mm. So we go to the Irish Times again, um, and this comes from Chris Johns, and um, I have to say I agree with him on this. Um, Chris Johns' point in this article that we were going over is that look, twenty twenty, if um, the Conservatives manage to hold on, they either have a majority. If again. It's very doubtful that they'll have a majority. If they get a coalition somehow and they manage to just cling on, um, it's going to be complete deja vu uh, all, all over again. Um, we, you know, Brexit is just a continuous merry-go-round and no one wants to admit that they made the wrong decision and got on and now they're starting to feel sick and they don't want to admit it. So they'd rather just throw up on the ride and just keep on going round and getting sick again and then throwing up again um, again it's just a never ending cycle so to article so bafflement and boredom are the two most common responses to Brexit just wait until the trade negotiations start <laughs> I, I agree um, I've already said this part of Brexit is the beginning of the beginning. Brexit really hasn't even started yet. So if you're bored or baffled by this, then you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> Brussels and London are gearing up for January or February. They assume a Johnson electoral election victory. The alternatives are too messy to plan for. A hung parliament means further chaos. A Labour government in some kind of coalition promises of another renegotiated withdrawal agreement and another referendum. Very messy indeed. Nobody in Brussels thinks 11 months will be long enough. They've never been done before. It takes years. Brexiteers say that it is possible given the unique starting point of the complete trade alignment. That's a delusion since it ignores the fact that no trade treaty in history has ever uh, has ever erected rather than dismantled trade barriers. <coughs> the more Johnson promises a quick trade deal with the US, the higher um, the higher will be uh, for the barriers with the EU. Given the lack of time and Johnson's commitment to a to no extension of the transition period, which will quickly be uh, be back to planning for a very hard Brexit at the end of 2020. Deja vu all over again. Johnson doesn't mean what he says. That's a good rule of thumb. Websites are appearing uh, that trick uh, that track his lies, and I recommend Peter O'Barns. So, <coughs> just as he's sooner or later ring eggs on just about everything and everybody he could uh, easily announce or ask for an extension of the transition period. On this possibility, and only this, I'm inclined to take him at his word. Extensions means more EU, EU budget uh, contributions. Given the way in which uh, the British general election come round every other year, he won't want to be in that position uh, of still de facto being in the EU. At a possible time of his next attempt to stay in Downing Street, his only ambition worth paying attention to. So, the highest probable outcome is a hard Brexit at the end of next year, or at least months of familiar <coughs> oh dear. months of familiar speculation about one, with all the intended uh, with all the attached economic and political uncertainty and damage that brings with it. We can do nothing about our ennui, but enlightenment is possible. That, of course, requires the effort and engagement with facts and detail. One of the reasons why Brexit is taking so long is the unwillingness of one side to do the hard yards. British Brexiteers continue to make assertions that fly in the face of reality. It's been that way since the very beginning, even before that. We've talked about that continuously on this channel. Just watch Johnson's mumbling and stumbling speech last Thursday where he promised no checks of any kind between Britain and Northern Ireland. He doesn't understand his own deal. 
he described his deal as terrific for Northern Ireland because it means continued single market membership and maintenance of freedom of movement. It's nice to know that irony is flourishing. <coughs> Once again, that can't happen. If Britain leaves the European Union, then there has to be a customs border either on the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, or there has to be a border in the Irish Sea. And we already know the DUP's feeling, the DUP's feelings on uh, the DUP. Yeah, <laughs> um, uh, I'm going to call them the DNC, but it's not. That's the American, <laughs> American one. Uh, the DUP's feelings on that border in the Irish Sea. They don't want it to happen. And many um, British Conservatives, uh, again, remember that their full name for the party is the Conservative and Unionist Party, um, are, may back it, but many, especially in the ERG, I think, are at the first chance, if they think they can leave the EU and do all the... Um, Thatcherite stuff that they've dreamed for years of doing, then they will abandon Northern Ireland at the first opportunity they get. So be wary, uh, as we've said before, Boris Johnson will say one thing and then do something completely else. He is a promiser to get what he wants, and he doesn't deliver on his promises. He's a liar. So, Dennis McShane, a former British politician, coined the term <laughs> Brexcertainty. A perfectly, that perfectly captures all of this. In 2014, he wrote a book in which he correctly predicted that Britain would vote to leave. In a recent article written under the auspices of the London School of Economics, he takes us through the history of anti-EU thinking. In fact, we're going to go through this because it is quite a good article. He describes how both uh, the left and the right across Europe have typically been opposed to the European project, and at the more extremes of the left and right parties, the more extreme the anti-EU rhetoric. Jacob Rees-Mogg, for instance, didn't invent the accusation of vassalage against the EU. Recently uh, deceased Jack Chirac, originally a communist who went on to be prime minister, uh, president and mayor, railed against the EU, in 1978, a distinctly Brexiteer to in distinctly Brexiteer tones. France, he said, must stay uh, must say no to becoming a vassal state of a federal Europe. Jack Callaghan, the only person to have held uh, held the four great UK offices of state, also began his political life on the far left. McShane reminds us that in 1971, Callaghan was marking a proto uh, Farage's was making proto Farage's speeches that argued the reason why Britain shouldn't have nothing to do with Europe is that they don't speak English. Both the main British political parties have had long Europhobic periods. The anti EUism is uh, is pose is is a pose that extremists adopt. Two forces are at work. First, extremists seek chaos. Second, they see conspiracies everywhere. The EU is a conspiracy against workers or capitalists, depending on where you stand. What extremists do, don't really care about is Europe. Their other obsession is merely a means to an end, or driven by the demented worldview. Uh, Mart, uh, Matt Levine of Bloomberg wrote this week about how online uh, Discord uh, online dis Discord brokers are in, in very in inadvertently <coughs> uh, permitting traders to cheaply adopt massively leveraged uh, market bets. The game that some investors play isn't just to make money, it's about bragging rights. It's about being able to most how they hack the stock market. A similar motivation was seen in the run-up to the financial crisis. Traders want to make money for sure, but also love to boast how the invention of things like CDOs which were akin to the video games hacks that they brought during their, their downtime. Brexiteers are sometimes uh, like that. Dominic Cummings looks like a video game hacker, one who just happened to delight in hacking the political system. McShane puts it beautifully. The EU is imperfect, but it is the best effort made in two millennia of European history to allow such different peoples to live relatively harmoniously together. 
extremists and hackers have very different ideas and they are winning. And I completely agree with that at the moment. Um, and it's, it's difficult to say where to begin because I'm definitely someone who is on the left, but I am no mind means, you know, far, far left. Um, I definitely count myself as a social, um, someone who is a social democrat. Um, I want, you know, social democracy. And I think the really what we need to be aiming for um, is a 50-50 split or 50% socialism and 50% capitalism. I think that that is the system we need to be aiming for in this country. I think it strikes the perfect balance between uh, <coughs> two worlds and also it will keep both sides in check because no one will want to break that fragile um, you know, that fragile balance because both sides will have tools to be able to work against each other. Again, in an, in an ideal world, I don't expect it to work, you know, that you know, that well. Um, of course, the world is, you know, full of ups and downs. Um, but I think that's the way we really need to be going. And I definitely agree that Corbyn is the guy who can bring this change. Now, you may disagree with me, and I think we are going to be in for an interesting time. I think you're going to see the Lib Dems make some very significant gains in this election. Um, this idea that especially uh, a lot of the posters have said, oh, Yorkshire's going to turn blue and it's going to be, you know, the first time it's ever been blue for centuries. I don't think that's going to happen at all. You will never convince the people of Barnsley to vote Conservative at all. It ain't going to happen. I will be, I will, if that happens, and that, I, I will be generally shocked if that happens, and I will make a video about my shock. Um, I'll even do a Paul Jervis Watson of Imagine My Shock um, this morning, uh, but I very doubt it's going to happen because these areas have for generations um, been damaged significantly by the Tories. They are not going to suddenly forget that. They are not going to suddenly forget that it is the Tories who have brought on austerity. The bigger threat I see is not um, Labour voters switching to Tory. It's Tory voters in their heartlands switching to Lib Dems. Um, a lot of what you've seen in uh, the Tory heartlands is this big resurgence of very pro-EU uh, people. And those ideas of being European and being open and being free and being travel. Now they don't want to lose that and they know what the Tory party wants is to leave the European Union. So I think you will potentially see a lot of um, Tory strongholds or Tory um, strong places lose to the Liberal Democrats. I think that is entirely possible to see. Um, <coughs> but the idea of uh, the Conservatives breaking through, they call what the, the Red Wall, um, I don't think it has a, a chance of happening. I know there's lots of, there are a couple of posters saying it might happen. There's other posters saying it's not going to happen. Um, again, we'll have to see what happens. Uh, but as we've already seen, the Tories have had a very bad start uh, to the campaigning week and it's been nothing but scandal after scandal after scandal. So... You know, uh, how that will reflect in, in future polls, we'll have to see.